On November 1, 1966, a fire was reported in a canyon near the boundary of the Angeles National Forest just outside the city of San Fernando. Fire danger had been above normal for most of the fire season, and at least six strong periods of Santa Ana winds had occurred during the last month. The general weather forecast for the day included a high temperature of 90 degrees and relative humidities as low as 12 percent. Prevailing winds were out of the northeast at 10 to 15 miles per hour. The first resources arrived on scene at 0600 and quickly set the fire suppression objectives. They determined that the west side of the fire was approaching an area burned in 1962 and the south side would be taken care of by the L.A. County and city fire departments when the fire reached the bottom of the slope. All federal resources were to be expended on the north and east sides of the fire and the north end was to be held on the Santa Clara fuel break which was identified in a pre-attack plan. At 0830, a special weather forecast was issued which called for Santa Ana conditions with winds from the northeast to east at 30 miles per hour with gusts up to 50. Maximum temperatures in 95 degrees and a minimum relative humidity of 10 percent. The fuel type consisted of chemise, sage, and sumac. The moisture of live chemise was only 60 percent, which is the minimum possible for this species. The Del Rosa, Dalton, and Chileo hotshots, along with two county crews, were building fire line downhill along the east flank. The El Carrizo hotshots arrived at 1430, and the superintendent, Gordon King, was told by the line boss to leapfrog the Del Rosa crew and coal trail the fire edge if possible. Mention was made for the steep terrain beyond the point where the Del Rosa crew was working. They were told that the main ridge could be used as an alternative if it was impossible to follow the burned edge. There was no radio available for Superintendent King. The crew worked past the Del Rosa hotshots and continued coal trailing the fire edge to a point where the fire edge dropped into a steep chimney canyon. At this point, King had to make a decision. Please get into your groups and discuss alternative courses of action. Welcome back. Let's walk through what actually happened and take you to the next pivotal decision point for the El Carrizo hotshots. King led the first units of his crew carefully down and across the steep, rocky face along the fire's edge. The division boss, unable to contact King directly because King had no radio, made his way down to point A on the main ridge. Since he could not see King at the time, he radioed a liaison officer for the county, who was positioned on the road below the fire. The division boss was told that King and his crew were coal trailing the edge of the fire and they would be able to construct line down the rocky chute in the Chimney Canyon. The division boss waited until the remaining members of the El Carrizo crew cleared the rocky face and instructed the Del Rosa hotshots to wait at point A until he checked to see if this was the best way down. He would call them on the radio and advise them to either come down the chute and leapfrog the El Carrizo crew or go down the ridge and come in from below. The division boss then proceeded down the rock face. When he was about halfway down, he could see down the chimney most of the way. Most of King's men had crossed the rock slide at the head of the chute and worked their way down to a small bench that paralleled the chute. The fire had backed down the bench and gone out. It was not a clean burn. King and his men were at a place later known as the Diamond, with the rest of the crew strung out up the chute coal trailing. At the time, a helitanker was working in the lower part of the deep canyon to the west. The fire situation at approximately 1530 was as follows. From the Diamond, the burned edge dipped into and across the deep canyon to the west and then down to where the county crews and dozer was working. King could see that the terrain was too steep to coal trail from the chimney canyon into the deep canyon to the west 
and the bottom of this gully was obviously a difficult and dangerous place to hold the fire. Now let's get back into our groups and complete the second part of this exercise. Welcome back. We recently had a chance to talk to Gordon King, and he shared with us his recollection of that tragic day. Uh, it was steep, and I knew it was steep. And, yeah, when you, pick, when you picked up that last pitch, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a good drop. That's when I told Raymond Chi, that was with my head hook, and he was, you know, my guy, I said, Chi, wait a minute, you stay right here, and I'm going to go take a look at this slide area. And when I got over to it, walked down and the fire was stopped on the other side of the slide area. But up above, it had burned up right up to the very crown of this the slide area and burned all the brush out. Well, there was, that had been put out. There was no fire up there at all. But I could see rocks coming down. And they, would, they weren't coming down, you know, all the time. One or two would come down. Something would kick loose, grab me, pull it down like that. And I pulled Ray down, and I said, you know, we're going to have to cross this thing to get over to the other side right over there, because that's where we're going to have to start. We pick it up along that, that ridge line. It looks like we go right on down that ridge line, go to the bottom. And, you know, he said, okay. He said, I'm going to go across. You stay right here, and I'm going to go across. If you see anything coming, you let me know. You know, and so I had my shovel. Up, and I started across. Nothing came down. We'd, we'd worked our way down, and I, and I had just gone through a, pretty good sized stand of chemise and it was kind of in a V shape got in a dropped off of the other side of it and I almost dropped off with it when I went through I was holding on I saw it and I just bent the rod the sum over and kept doing it and I yelled back to Ray said that's a watch the drop on the other side of that and said, we'll cut that thing out of there so everybody could see that uh, it was about a five or six foot drop and he would he cut through it left a little bit because that's the way we used to do things. You don't cut, one guy doesn't cut the whole thing down. Just cut a little bit and move on. Next guy cuts a little bit and move on. Pretty soon you get the fourth or fifth hook. It's all gone. Mm -hmm. And Ray came through. Uh, I yelled at him. He says, I'm going further on down, Ray. And he said, okay. And I went on down and I was in a, in a sort of a draw. Just a tiny little thing. And I could, I could look up, I could see the county guy still down below me, and I could look back, I could see Ray up behind me there. And I heard a helicopter. I didn't see it, never did see it, but I heard it. And at first it didn't dawn on me anything, you know, okay, you can't see it, so, you know. And it, then, you know, I heard the noise, and I, later on I assumed that it passed below me in that draw, and I didn't see it because it was below me. And that's when uh, I heard somebody say something down below there about uh, he missed or he didn't do it right or something like that. I can't really remember what, but they were yelling. And you know, then the copter, I saw the copter after that, it was heading on out the valley and it was climbing up and going around. Didn't dawn on me what he did at the time. It just, you know, he, he was not on the fire line. He was inside the fire going down. I didn't pay much attention to it. And about uh, three or four minutes later, I saw smoke. And I looked down, and it was still like over there. You know, we were here, it was like over there. I heard something that I've heard before, it's always put a little fear in me. It's, it's fire going through brush. You, when you hear it once, you'll always remember it. And I heard it, and I thought, now that's, not right. There shouldn't be any fire over here. You know, something not right. Then I heard the guys across the way yelling. Uh, and they were yelling at one another. They weren't yelling at me. They were yelling at one another about something. And I wouldn't pay them a whole heck of a lot of attention about it because I was more interested about what I was hearing. And I, I turned around and looked at Ray, and Ray was just above me. And he all of a sudden, he was higher than I was. All of a sudden, he yelled out and said, Gordon, get out of there. And I turned around to look at him because, you know, again, and I, you know, I said, oh man, there's something going on here. And he had already called reverse stool order. There, there wasn't just my job to do that. He, you know, anybody could do that. And they were on their way out when I could hear this coming. No fire. 
I could just hear this coming. And the first thing I re remember was I had dark glasses on, sunglasses. They went poof and fell off my face. Then I knew that what was happening there was not right. You know, it, it just I didn't dawn on me at the time what it was. Couldn't feel anything. Okay, then why why did your glasses come off? They melted. Okay. Hot air. Okay. I, I could hear this hot air coming in, you know, this this noise coming through the brush. And I could see more smoke down below. And I thought, yeah, that's it. It's amazing what you think, but that's exactly what I thought. That's it. And the next thing I remember, I was in the brush patch, and I had my hands above my head because I had my sleeves were rolled up then, and I, all the skin was just hanging off my hands and arms. And I was in the brush patch, and I couldn't figure out how I got there. I mean, it just, you just don't know how things happen. You know, your, your brain just shuts down, and you just do things. But I was there, and I remember that there was a, there was a truck down below me, a pickup truck. And there was a guy going like this, you know, at me, and I couldn't hear him, but I could see him. When I got down below things, I could start hearing things again. At, at that, that time, all I could hear was a roar in my ear. And, you know, I was thinking to myself all this time, you know, it's quiet. But I could, I could remember there was a roaring going on in my ear. And then I began to hear a helicopter, and I began to hear people yelling and things like that, you know. I turned around, looked up where they where they were, and there was a helicopter up there. Two of them up there, actually. One of them was just lifting off. I stood around, stood there for a while watching that, and you know, thinking to myself, "Damn, you know, what did I do wrong? You know, what the hell happened?" We were looking for fire. Mm -hmm. You were looking for hot air. Oh, you know, <laughs> we were looking for fire. Uh, that's that wasn't the first time I've ever felt hot air, but. Uh, that's the first time I was ever in the position to feel it like that, but uh, I don't know how to describe it. I don't. I hope I never. Nobody ever gets into that position again to have to f describe how it sounded or how it felt. Never take anything for granted. The most seemingly innocent event can be tragically deadly. You, know, you, you have more control over a firestorm than you do thinking that you're in the clear and not preparing yourself for it. And that's basically what I think. You know, I wasn't prepared for what happened because I wasn't in that mode. I was thinking cold trail, down the bottom hill, no big deal. Just work our way down slowly, don't get hit by the rocks, and we'll be out of here in a couple hours. Pump problem or operator problem? Let's find out. What's going on here, Tom? Uh, I can't get this frickin' pump started. Ah, uh, we'll get it started. Let's square away this pump site first. Copy that. Okay, so as you can see, we've got the pump site squared away. The pump site is level. The pump's not vibrating. It's trying to slide into the creek. We got our hazmat issue uh, resolved with the containment berm and the uh, absorbent pad. Fuel can located properly away from the exhaust. Foot valves on a shovel. Keep dirt out of the pump head. Pump set up according to the instructions in the kit. Everything looks good to go. Let's get this thing running. All right. Well, before we start it up, something I find useful is I like to start at the foot valve, work my way towards the pull cord, 
and uh, just double check everything, make sure we're good to go. Okay. So our foot valve is submerged on a clean surface, looking good. Next, we want to check the draft hose coupling on the suction side of the pump pad, make sure we're not going to suck any air and lose our prime. That's good and tight. Now we'll check the priming cap. Same deal there. Lose your prime. That's nice and tight. Now we're just going to prime the pump head. Make sure it's good to go. It's got already got water to it when we go to start this thing. So you want to stroke this thing until water comes squirting out of the handle area. That should be good to go. As quick as possible, you want to uncouple this and couple the uh, your hose lid. Now this is a pressure fitting. You don't really have to. Doesn't have to be gorilla tight. Hand tight will work. So now I'm just going to verify that the fuel line, the fuel inlet block is good and tight. Okay. Now odds are the last thing this pump did was got turned off, so I'm going to make sure the ignition switch is up, on. I'm going to make sure the reset rod is in, and now I'm going to prime the carburetor. So I'm going to squeeze this primer bulb until I see the fuel in this hose just reach the bottom of the carburetor. And I'm good. So now that's primed. We know we got fuel. Is that fuel vent open? Yes, it is. Okay, cool. Is that uh, fuel can lid tight? Yeah, that's tight. Okay, Tom, it's pretty cold. We should probably choke this thing. Okay, what's the choke do? Uh, choke just uh, increases the amount of fuel entering the engine to get enough liquid fuel to create enough vapor for ignition. And you normally do that when it's cold or hasn't been run in a long time? Yeah, cold starts only, pretty much. Okay. And what's next? Put it in the uh, warm-up start position? Yeah, now you just want to get a firm grasp on that thing and pull that cord. Okay, now that wanted to go. It did. We could have opened the choke at that point, but we can open it now. Okay. And tug it another couple times, it should fire right up. Okay, so I'm disengaging the choke. Yep. We've heard the pop. Yep. You want to let it warm up for about two minutes. Okay. And then you can go to full throttle. Hey Tom, we just lost the water show. What's going on? I don't know, dude. It just revved up super high, about blew my ears out, and here we are now. Okay, so we had an overspeeding situation. Right. Huh. Well, I know that the reset rod is designed to pop out when that occurs. Okay. Thus, killing the engine. So, let's see if that reset rod's popped out. So why did that thing pop out? Well, the pump was overspeeding. It's designed to push water under a load. When there's no load on the engine, it spins too fast. And the air vanes and the cooling fins pop the reset rod out. So what are you saying? I think we lost the prime somehow. OK, so, so we need to check and see if everything's tight. You bet. So see, our foot valve's still in the water. That's still tight. Oh. I think our priming cap rattled loose while you were napping. We're going to just verify we still have our water in the pump head here. Yeah, it's not dribbling out like it should, so we're going to go ahead and reprime the pump head. Hey, where are your earplugs, Tom? Uh, well, if I wear earplugs, so I get all dizzy and stuff. Well, it's PPE. The kid comes with like 12 pairs. Let's go ahead and put some in. All right, copy. Okay, Tom, I think we got that problem solved. Let's go ahead and try to start it again. All right, sounds good. What the hell, dude? Dude, you got that thing on choke? Yeah? No, dude, it was just running. It's warm already. We don't need to choke it now. 
So, but I think we flooded at this point, so we need to correct it. Okay, so we need in. to, there's some sort of deflooding procedure we need to go through? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and disconnect the fuel line. I'll take the spark plug out. As long as we got the spark plug out, we might as well check for spark. Make sure that's not a problem. I've reconnected it to the boot, and the plug body is grounded to the pump head. Tom, you want to pull that starter cord a couple times, and I'll observe the gap here for the spark? I'd love to. Oh, yeah, we got good spark. Next, we need to take the cylinder drain plug out. It's located on the bottom of the crankcase. Oh, there it is. That bad boy. OK. It's kind of hard to get onto. That's a copper gasket, Tom. It seals the uh, bottom of the crankcase. You need to make sure you don't lose it when you're taking it out. You need to make sure it goes back in. OK, now that I got this out, what's next? Well, fuel line's disconnected. We've removed the fuel from the situation. Now we're yep. just going to air out the cylinder. We need to put the choke and the throttle in full run-run position. OK, so the choke's going to be back. Throttle's going to be all the way open. Roger. OK, and I'll just pull on it. Yep. All that extra fuel will come out of the bottom. You bet. We're just we're just drying out the inside of the well, How many times do I pull, pull on this thing, man? Ah, 12, 15. Let's be safe. You smell that fuel? Oh, yeah. OK, should be unflooded. Uh, let's put the spark plug back in and the cylinder drain plug back in. All right, that's tight, dude. Okay, let's What's hook, next? Let's hook that fuel line back up. Well, she's hooked up, Captain. Okay, Tom, let's leave it in the run-run position with the throttle and choke. Okay. And let's uh, give it a couple pulls, see what it does. Copy that. Okay. So now we've tried that. We know it's not flooded yep. anymore. Now we know we don't have enough fuel. Okay. So let's go ahead and move the throttle level to start warm up. Yep. And go ahead and give it a choke. Okay. And give it a couple pulls. Okay. Right there. Now we know we know we're good. Choke off. Give it another pull. There you have it. Sweet. So remember, well, by now you're aware that our subject is weather. Weather related to forest fires. My name is Louis Allen. Weather is my business, and my job is to get across to you the importance and the role that weather plays in the start and spread of forest fires. The Weather Service provides forecasts on a number of scales to make sure that firefighters are getting the information they need, whatever type of incident they go on. Um, the types of forecasts that we issue range from the daily forecast that's available every day, twice a day, 
to a specialized spot forecast if you're doing a prescribed burn or a wildfire that's just started or an incident meteorologist can be on your fire and they're a great resource for those things that you need to know about the weather. When you're out on a fire, you can experience a whole range of winds. You can experience the Groundhog Day effect of stagnant weather. Your incident action plan or your forecast says, okay, today is going to be like yesterday, not much change. Those are the types of verbal clues you're getting that there's no real major weather system coming in that's going to change things. So what happens when you're out there and you're, you're getting those verbal clues of, okay, today's going to be like yesterday, high pressure, not much change. You're actually looking for the convective winds. Uh, that's kind of a fancy, more technical term for when the sun hits a slope, it heats up, the air rises, and you start all these motions in place. And then when the sun sets or it's not hitting on a slope, you don't have that radiation, so you're going to be a little bit cooler and those little subtle temperature differences they create wind up slope up valley during the day down slope down valley at night and that should be reflected in your your IMET forecast or any spot forecast that you get you're going to get squirrely winds you're going to get things that are just a little bit different or in a different direction from what the IMET or that that forecast has for your area but generally they should be relatively accurate, those winds. So on a persistent day where you're, you're heating up during the day, it's a nice clear day, no major fronts, no big cumulus buildups, you can expect those terrain-induced upslope, downslope type of winds. The second type of wind that you can get during the afternoon, especially, is called mixed down. When the sun starts to heat up the atmosphere, um, sometimes you'll hear it at your IAP briefing, uh, we're going to have mixed down winds, or the inversion is going to break between 1300 and 1500 today. Uh, you have that mixing that occurs, and you have all the winds that are a little bit stronger above the mixing depth. And then as that inversion level breaks, all that momentum, all that oomph, all that push from the upper level winds can mix down to the surface. So what you're looking for out in the field to clue you in that that could be an important part of the wind equation that day is to listen to your IMET inversion level breaking or we're going to have some stronger winds this afternoon or expect the inversion to break at 1330 today. That's a clue that those types of winds can kick in. A gradient wind is named because of the gradient that exists between a high and a low pressure system. In the summertime, those changes may not be accompanied by rain, especially in the west. So you're looking for terms such as dry cold frontal passage today, or weak cold front, or trough, low pressure. All those kind of signal gradient wind day. Uh, it's very tricky to assess how much of that gradient wind is actually going to be experienced on the fire line. Uh, if the storm or the front is powerful enough, those winds can surface and they can take what is typically an upslope, downslope wind and drive it in the opposite direction. And then the last one, which is extremely important, is if you get those cumulus buildups, if you get a regular thunderstorm out there, you can have convective or thunderstorm winds. They can be very erratic, they can be very gusty, they're critically important. So if you're out there and you're noticing thunderstorms develop, or even moderately, it doesn't even have to be raining or thundering, moderate buildups, you know, big, puffy, beautiful clouds, might not be so beautiful on the line because they can induce some winds. You know, your standard cumulus buildup will give you a 30 to 40 mile per hour wind that wasn't there and it will come out of nowhere. The big thunderstorms, they can really, really cause some havoc because you can get 50 to even 80 mile an hour downburst dry winds out of those things.
If you're lucky enough to have an incident meteorologist on your fire, uh, you have the capability of having a localized IAP forecast or briefing. What's not going to be in that forecast is the exact weather at the exact time and moment where you're going to be on a specific division fighting the fire. Even though the forecast is designed for that specific spot, your IAP and your briefing is still going to be a more generalized type of briefing or, or piece of information. So when an IMAC gives you that forecast, we're giving you a, a yardstick. We're giving you that, uh, uh, even though it's a yard, it's pretty specialized for your fire. The type of weather you're going to be seeing at the incident is going to be measured in inches and not the yard. Those inches are where your personal judgment comes into play. Are embers drifting up, up into the air instead of sideways? Are the winds starting to pick up? Uh, what are the tops of the trees doing? Are they swaying back and forth? Those types of clues that should give you a, a kind of an instant brief snapshot. In addition to what the IMAC gives you, that things are developing, things are changing, things are happening at that time of day. So what an IMAC can't do is to give you that momentary snapshot where you are at that particular particular moment, uh, the exact weather conditions where you're standing. You should have a 90% idea, but that 10% has to be filled in by your training, by your awareness, and by your, your, your situational awareness of the surrounding area. When you're out on the line and you're, you're in canopy, uh, you can pick up on some visual clues of how the winds are changing. If it's the morning, you can kind of take a look, look up in the sky to see if there's any cumulus clouds or any visual indicators of, of instability. Um, if your atmosphere is absolutely clear, that can be also an uh, indicator of instability. Uh, if you have a little puffy uh, sheep-like looking clouds, you know, they're actually called flockus clouds, a flock of sheep. You can remember it that way. If it looks like there's a bunch of sheep at 9 in the morning up there, it's unstable. And you can kind of expect that vertical movement of the wind later in the afternoon, or maybe even thunderstorm development, dry thunderstorm development. So what can you do as a firefighter to key in on these winds? First of all, listen to your forecast. Listen for the term unstable today or high hanes today. That's the first clue. And you can combine that when you go out on the ground with your visual indicators. Smoke can actually inhibit winds. It can block out the sun so much that you're not going to get the convective winds. It's going to be very kind of a surreal, strange, you know, you're in smoke and nothing's happening and you expect something to go, but it's so thick that nothing happens. But if you're in a run-of-the-mill fire where it's relatively clear, it's the afternoon and you start seeing that smoke, Instead of spreading out horizontally and creating that layer, if the visibility starts to improve suddenly, if you see smoke getting up higher into the atmosphere, if you see it you know, punching through above the tree line and starting to bubble up, again, indicator that the cap is broken, that the, those winds could, could surface in, as, in a matter of 30 minutes or even 15 minutes. So watching smoke is vital. It can clue you in on when the inversion's breaking. You could get spotted in the direction of where that smoke is going, if there are active embers that are floating up into the, into the column. So it's, it's a great indicator. It's using that side effect of the fire to determine what your winds are doing. Feedback from the field is critical to performance. And just because a forecast doesn't work one day uh, doesn't mean that you're not going to get quality good forecasts later on. And those quality forecasts are only generated when we receive information back of how well we're doing. And if you don't give the data back, we don't know what's happening. And we can't build the database to improve the forecast, not only for now, but 10 years down the line. Uh, if you go back to that area, we have a weather record for that area. So not only are you helping your forecast by helping us finding out how we're actually doing, 
you're building a legacy of making sure that future firefighters are protected from better forecasts from that data that you're giving us. Fire weather forecasts are designed to make sure that you are safe. And you can't be safe unless you have a little bit of err on the side of caution. We have a tendency to overwarn and overpredict for a purpose. And that purpose is to capture bad events and not miss them. And that results in some false alarms. It's better for us to overwarn and overdo it in terms of safety than to underdo the forecast. And then somebody says, that wind shift was unexpected. We didn't have it in the forecast. It wasn't there. Well, it should be there. We strive for it to be there, and it's a safety issue. In the final analysis, however, you must add your own knowledge and understanding of fire behavior. As fire control men, the weather indeed is a very important part of your business. At this point, the facilitator should have instructed you to complete the self-study assessment number one. After watching the video segment, you will be asked to complete an additional assessment. The wildland fire environment is constantly changing, and your safety depends on quickly recognizing and adapting to rapidly shifting circumstances. Your level of health and fitness influences how you adjust to these changes. To gather more insight on these topics, we sat down with two experts in their field. Firefighters have kind of traditionally always been a real good job. kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of population, and that's good. That has a lot of benefits. Uh, we're, we're, we tend to be a real hardy bunch, but I think one of the downsides of that then is that uh, at times perhaps uh, we don't talk more about some of these more psychological or what oftentimes gets called touchy-feely <laughs> kinds of things. Uh, with regard to what it takes to perform real well. And it, again, it takes a whole lot more than just being physically fit to be a real good wildland firefighter. You've got to be psychologically strong and you've got to really have your, your things in order environmentally with regard to what surrounds you uh, in order to really have the decision space and the, and the mindset to be able to successfully do the job. The way I view performance is, is really kind of from a three-ring model, which is something that I was taught uh, kind of during my graduate studies, and it's just always been something that's really resonated with me because it just makes sense, and that is basically that if you're looking at performance and overall performance, that it's really going to come from, from three different areas, which is physically, you know, how fit are you, how capable are you of doing the job and the tasks that are necessary, and then the other ring uh, is the psychological side. So how strong are you? How, how mentally capable are you of dealing with some of the challenges that come with the job? And then the last one, like I mentioned, is kind of the environmental side, which is what's your support system look like and what are all those things that, that kind of surround you in your daily life like and how do they help kind of buoy you up uh, with regard to performing? And when we need to perform optimally, optimal performance comes from where those three rings intersect. There's going to be a very small area where they share a, a piece of, of common ground, and that's optimal performance, basically. But that's really hard to get to. But at times, our environment uh, asks us or even demands us to be in or very near that optimal performance zone. I think that as an organization, there will be a long-standing relationship between fitness and our firefighters. Um, if we look at the American population, obesity is on the rise, heart disease is on the rise, but the job isn't getting any easier. So fitness will always be a critical component of firefighting, no matter how we look at it. You, you have to have the work capacity to do the job, not only for yourself, but for your fellow firefighters. Because if you aren't able to do your job, that means they have to pick it up and do that job for you. 
As an exercise program for a crew, it, it needs to be balanced and have both that aerobic fitness component, uh, running, hiking, doing those sort of activities, and the strength. Um, Pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups, lifting weights. You need to have that balance. As a firefighter, your, your job is to pack heavy stuff around in the woods. The best way to get ready for that is to pack heavy stuff around in the woods. In the springtime, get out, start hiking, get your boots on, start breaking them in. The National Fire Center in NIFC and Boise has two publications regarding fitness training programs. There's the FireFit program and the Fitness and Work Capacity. Um, both these programs help firefighters design a workout plan based on the job demands. Um, firefighting is a very specific occupation and um, the specificity of the exercise training to the actual job is very critical in helping a firefighter have the appropriate fitness during the season. The University of Montana and the work of Dr. Brent Ruby, they've gone out during the summer months to actual fire camps and tested firefighters, looking at the energy demands that firefighters have. And from their work, we found that firefighters spend four to 6,000 calories a day, which is two to three times the daily American diet of 2,000 calories. There's a tech tip produced by MTDC, Feeding the Wildland Firefighter, that kind of gives a breakdown of what athletes, which firefighters are, should be consuming when they're working. Uh, carbohydrates consistently throughout the work shift have been shown by studies from the university to improve job performance in the latter half of the day by up to 40 percent. Uh, the studies on protein are that it is not a, as helpful as carbohydrates during long duration activities or events. Uh, when you think of athletes like a triathlete, you don't see them eating a steak on their bike when they're doing an Ironman. They're having energy bars which are very carbohydrate dense. And if you're eating those constantly throughout the day, you usually don't have a problem. But people will have a candy bar and then not eat anything and they get that crash feeling afterwards because they have low carbohydrates. A big motto that we would like to get out there is to eat and drink frequently. It doesn't have to be huge amounts, and I think that's a big misconception firefighters have is they need to be drinking a ton of water. They just need to be drinking throughout the day to maintain their hydration status. Not, you know, it's not a set number that some people say you need to drink X amount of water bottles a day. It just you need to be frequently drinking throughout the shift. And if you feel thirsty, you've already are behind the power curve. You've already your body's already about 10% dehydrated at least. The recommendations that MTDC has put out in the past are for every two or three bottles of water, you should have a sports drink to kind of keep that water and electrolyte balance in check. Meals have changed a lot since the old 55 gallon drums that used to just drop out and say, here's everything in a big stew, go to town on it. It's become a lot more science based and these are the type of things we need to see in our lunches. Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are a great carbohydrate source and if you can tolerate them, they would be a lot more beneficial to you than a typical uh, meat wad that you see in your lunch. Hey, you got your Snickers in my mayonnaise. Oh, <laughs> you got your mayonnaise on my Snickers. <laughs> These are two, two great tastes that taste great together. This upcoming summer, hopefully, there will be a new lunch contract for catered lunches. So in these new lunch contracts, we're recommending that instead of a big bag lunch that you sit down and eat at one time, it contains smaller, almost snack-like items that you can consume every you know, hour and a half to two hours that are high in carbohydrates. And hopefully that will give firefighters the energy they need to be able to do that job at the end of the day.
So just being physically fit, at least in my mind, is not enough. In order to do the job successfully uh, and effectively, we have to be more than just a physical stud. We, we have to be able to handle the psychological challenges, whatever those are, whether it's getting along with your crewmates or your teammates, whether it's handling the stress that comes from an emerging incident, uh, whether it comes from, from facing some sort of, sort of transition, uh, be it onto another crew or into another position or whatever it is, uh, and then environmentally dealing with all the things that go on outside of work. Uh, in order to perform optimally, we need to, to be able to do all those things. And oftentimes it's just a matter of doing a little map check and figuring out, all right, which one of them is my best area? Uh, that, that becomes my anchor point then, that's, that's my strength. Which, which one of them is my area that most needs improvement? Well, that's, that's the head of the fire is the analogy that I use. That's the one that we've got to, got to attack, obviously. And then the way we get there, is up the flanks of it, and, the, and that's the, the area that is kind of a strength, but not our, our best strength, basically. So just kind of doing some self-analysis and figuring out, all right, where do I need work? Wh which one of those areas uh, most needs my attention at this given time? Uh, and once we've figured that out, then that's where we go. That's, that's the area we start working on, uh, realizing that uh, we've also got a strength from which to go forth uh, as we try and do that. So that, that's just kind of the analogy that I use of, of equating it to the fire triangle, which is we need heat and fuel and oxygen uh, in order to get any kind of combustion. Uh, the same can be said with performance. We need to be at our top physically, but we need to be there psychologically, environmentally as well, or we're just not going to get there. These concepts may not be entirely new to you. Ivan Papaliti is a human performance specialist with the U.S. Forest Service. He is a longtime lead plane pilot with a strong background in accident investigation both on the aviation side and the ground firefighter side. Ivan describes what he calls the gap. The gap is a comparison between how work is designed or structured from a management perspective, like the IRPG and Fireline Handbook, for example, compared to how the work is actually performed by firefighters on the ground in the thick of action. There is always a gap. There will always be a gap. He identifies this gap as an obstacle in communicating with firefighters about their experiences that led to unfavorable outcomes. In this module, we'll discuss some of the reasons why this creates problems from an accident prevention side and the steps that are being taken to promote discussion between fire safety managers and operational firefighters. What is an accident? An accident is an unforeseen and unplanned event or circumstance. If we're looking at something that was not planned and not intended, why do we do accident investigation? The reason that we do it is for prevention. Because if we're really looking at prevention, the thing that we should be doing is simply looking for lessons learned out of these things so that they can be avoided. So we can describe the gap in greater detail as a result of this adverse outcome. So accident investigations came up with things like failure to follow policy and procedures. And in the dude fire, we came up with uh, failure to follow the 10 standard firefighting orders and that became the groundwork for us to take a look at our accidents in terms of the 10 standard firefighting orders. So what we ended up with was a blame and train cycle. This situation then identified human error as the cause of the accident and individuals were either counseled or disciplined. This led to less trust and less communication. The gap between management and firefighters was widening and the problems or conditions that supported the accident were still there. We can go back in and we can make a story out of what happened that makes complete sense. And sadly, in human related, in human performance related adverse outcomes or accidents, sometimes it doesn't make sense. It takes courage to talk about an accident that may be perceived as a mistake. A prideful culture doesn't take lightly what may be viewed as an embarrassing situation, especially in fire culture. But steps are being taken to develop systems that reward firefighters who tell their story. Fire leadership training emphasizes sharing experiences and as a way to improve decision making, improve overall performance, and break down this communication gap. We can observe things in a mechanical sense. We can take things to the laboratory and we can dis dissect them and take them down to their lowest component. But as we start 
to do this with human judgment, it becomes more and more difficult. We can't really break human judgment down into component parts because no two people fail at exactly the same point. If I put you in a circumstance and I put myself in a circumstance, we would fail at, at a different point, even though the circumstances were the same. And in fact, if we if I were in the same circumstance over and over and over again, I wouldn't fail at the same point because I would have learned from my experience. And this is very important. This is called heuristics. How much risk will you accept in the pursuit of your fireline objectives? Your experience and judgment will determine the course of action you choose. There will always be an opportunity cost. If we spend more time on the process, what does it cost us in the final outcome? This goes back to uh, pressures of effectiveness, thoroughness, trade-off. If we look at the 10 standard firefighting orders, for example, and we look at number 10, fight fire aggressively, having provided for safety first. This is a complete effectiveness, thoroughness trade-off. Because if we want to be completely effective at fighting the fire, we're going to be aggressive. But if we're going to be completely thorough, we're going to be completely safe. How can you be both completely safe and completely effective? we're asking our people to do is use their judgment to come to some middle ground of application of this standard firefighting order to understand that or to develop a way of, of implementing this philosophy that they have to make some sort of effectiveness thoroughness trade-off. Now our desire is that they make that trade-off on the basis of safety. What is normal or standard? Because we have to compare if we're going to say that somebody did something wrong we have to compare that against something which is right. So what is normal and standard? Is that well-defined? How far is below, for example? And was the rule clear or conflicted is where we really should be going. Most of these things avoid the question of why did these actions or these decisions make sense to the individual at the time? How many people think that Sully Sullenberg, the pilot of the airplane that crashed on the Hudson, was a hero? Most people feel that he was a hero. But let me submit something to you. If he had done exactly the same thing, and there had been a rogue wave, a helicopter that took off from the hill spot that's right near where he landed, there had been a ferry that went across the Hudson River that he impacted. If that had happened, he would be considered a villain for doing exactly the same thing that he did, for which he's now considered to be a hero. That's categorically unfair. It's unfair to vilify people, and it's unfair to prop them up as heroes. And if you listen to the speeches that Sullenberg is doing now, he doesn't claim to be a hero. He claims to be a pilot who is doing his job, doing the best that he could with a bad situation. The truth is that people create safety in a very unsafe world. That people, through naturalistic decision making, through heuristics, through taking action when they perceive that they're going down a dangerous path, they actually create safety. It's not that the world is safe and there's a bad person doing a bad thing. We pluck them out, put a good person in. The truth is, the world is unsafe and the people within our world create safety. So this, this kind of brings this to a, a different perspective. The system's view starts to take a more holistic approach to the entire accident scenario. And instead of focusing so much on what happened, it tries to understand why it happened. So instead of looking at things in terms of error, it looks at things instead in terms of, of what conditions supported error. And James Reason said that you cannot change the human condition, but you can change the conditions under which humans work. And this should be our goal. Our goal in management and safety program management in particular is to create a situation where our people are more likely to be successful. For individuals that are involved in in circumstances, in operations, they have many dimensions of information that, are, that they're being bombarded with from many, many directions. They have to take the stimulus and process the sti stimulus and make decisions. These decisions res result in courses of action. As each one of these decisions is made, the individual does not know the outcome. And it's very much like being in a tunnel. And most of the time, the tunnel ends up with a successful outcome. In fact, in our firefighting operations, about 98% of the time, we end up with a completely successful outcome. So the individual has an expectation as they're going through this, this maze or this tunnel that the outcome is going to be successful. In the 2% where we have problems, the accident investigators generally come back in and they look at that tunnel 
with very great clarity of hindsight. They can now look at each one of these decision points using, using their judgment, ascribe the word error to these decisions because they know the outcome. But for the individual who's involved in making those decisions, it's anything but clear. And most assuredly, if they knew that the outcome was going to be adverse, they wouldn't take the action. So for them, the clarity doesn't exist. And that's why it's really unfair to apply hindsight bias to these decisions and call them errors, having known the outcome. In fact, they're only errors knowing the outcome. And the more complex a situation is, the more error likely that situation becomes. The greater the possibilities are of having an error by adding more complexity. So there's a problem to this. This, this approach to the model. The other thing that can happen as a result of this linearity is, is that there's a lack of understanding of the 98% of the time that things are successful. In other words, 98% of the time, the individual recognizes the potential outcome, takes corrective action, and avoids that outcome. The individual should have that freedom to make that naturalistic determination of what they should do to avoid the potential conflict. They have to be able to see it to avoid it. They have to be able to react to it in order to avoid it. And that's not done through rules and regulations. That's done through heuristics and experience. In 1991, Paul Gleason wrote a paper titled LCES and Other Thoughts, drawing from a long firefighting career that started in 1964 and included working as a hotshot supervisor and district and regional FMO. His paper introduced the concept of lookouts, communications, escape routes, and safety zones as an interconnected system. It has since become the cornerstone for wildland firefighter safety and inspired another generation of firefighters. Brad Mayhew is one of those firefighters and has been analyzing LCES and how we use it. So LCES, I love LCES, right? In the wildland firefighting profession, it's just a ton of lists. We got, we got more lists sometimes than we know what to do with and actually uh, they all have a use and, and, and a place for us. Us. But if there's one list that, 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 we, that we count on, that we trust, it's LCES. Why? Because those are, those are the four key safety measures uh, for avoiding entrapment and burnover in, in the wildland context. Right? We trust LCES. We trust that if I have my LCES covered, if I have my LCES in place, I'm going to be able, if, even if this fire, everything goes to hell in a handbasket, I'm going to be able to get out of danger and get to safety, and at least I have my safety measures covered. I know that for the experienced firefighters, that is already intuitive, ingrained. It goes without saying, but I'm telling you, for a lot of folks, uh, there's times where we do LCES without even thinking about fire behavior. So if, if we could underline this as many times as possible, LCES doesn't make any sense if it's not based on fire behavior. But more than that, LCES has to be based on the fire potential, it has to be based on the worst case fire potential. In other words, I need a safety zone that's going to be adequate, a safety zone that's going to do the job if the fire does its worst. This is a key pitfall at LCES, right? Is is forgetting about change, right? Fire is dynamic. Fire is constantly changing. Wind is constantly changing. Um, the location of the sun is constantly changing. My location relative to the safety zone is constantly changing. We're in an environment that is constantly changing, constantly dynamic, but it's a very common pitfall to use LCES uh, in a way that's not dynamic. Uh, I call it set it and forget it syndrome, right? Where I said, I got it, I checked those things off. If the safety zone was there at 10 a.m., I guarantee you that thing is still there at 1,600 hours, right? So the question isn't, is it there? The question is, is it still adequate? Is it still going to be enough based on conditions now and how conditions might be changing? Is this thing still going to work for me? Dynamic fire behavior means dynamic safety measures. Dynamic fire potential, I need dynamic LCES. I 
I think one of the, the very useful things about approaching LCES in this way based on, based on the intent of LCES and based on fire potential is it gives you a way of defining the components of LCES in a very useful way. Take lookouts, for example. If you ask firefighters what's the definition of a lookout, what does it take to have a good lookout, you're going to get all kinds of answers. Do lookouts have to be on high spots, low spots, see the whole fire, see some, do how much experience, can they have collateral duties? There's all these factors, right? And it becomes pretty tricky to try to nail down exactly what it takes to have a good lookout for this situation and for every situation. Well, with this approach, it, it gives you a way, I, I think it gives you a way of doing it. Because what it allows you to do is it allows you to say, look, with this approach to LCES, what is the fundamental intent of a lookout? The fundamental intent of a lookout is someone who's going to see the early warning signs, recognize them, and be able to get the word to me in enough time for me to get to safety. What's the intent of the C in LCES? And one piece of that is, is, is when, when it's time to pull the trigger and get to the safety zone, I'm confident that there's a line of communication from my lookout directly to me and that the word's gonna get from him or her to me in enough time for me to get to safety. That's one part of communication now, CES. The other piece of it too has to do with making sure that I'm getting, getting and sharing key info about fire potential, about changing conditions, so that, so that as I'm noticing these key indicators, um, I'm not just keeping them to myself, but I'm making that, in, that information available to the folks around me so that they're using that to update their essay. And, they're recognizing the changes as well. How many of us do this, right? Where we go, do I have a way out of here? And you look at that little deer trail and you go, yeah, I got, I got, a, I got, a, I got, I got, under, I got a route, check, right? The real issue is if this fire starts cooking, if this thing starts doing its worst, is that escape route gonna be adequate for me? And in some situations, a 30 second escape route isn't gonna be adequate, right? Because a fire can get to you faster than you can get away from it. If I look at the fire potential in my best judgment, right? And I look at my LCS in my best judgment, I make the judgment call that look, based on what this fire is capable of, each element of my LCS is adequate. If this fire does its worst, I'm going to be able to get myself and, and my people I'm responsible for, I'm going to be able to get us to safety. But what that means is what? I can engage confidently. I'm still going to need to keep updating my essay. I'm still going to want to keep questioning, looking if something's changing. But you can have a three-hour escape route uphill with all kinds of gnarly stuff. You can have a three-day escape route. As long as that escape route is adequate based on the worst-case fire behavior, if it's adequate, it's adequate. It's a judgment call. Human beings are not gonna make perfect judgments, right? But, but our, there's no substitute for our subjective human judgment. What's the definition of a safety zone? How big does it need to be? Where does it need to be located? I don't know how you define that objectively. The only way to define a safety zone has to involve some element of human judgment, right? It is a judgment call to some degree. So let's define what that means. The issue with the safety zone has to be this. Based on what this fire is capable of, am I confident that this spot is going to be adequate, that we're going to be all right in there if this fire does what it's actually capable of doing today? It's not something that I do for OSHA. It's not something I do for the chiefs. It's not something, it's not something for the guys in City Hall or the state capitol or even in Washington. We don't do LCES for them, right? We do LCES for us. LCES is for me to avoid me getting burned and the other people. The purpose of this module is to basically emphasize for each and every 
firefighter, that they are fire behavior specialists out on the ground. We want to encourage people to be, to, to go back to those basic assessments that we have taught them through 190 and 290 and 390 and 490. It's a basic preface there that people have the skills to make fire behavior predictions when they're out on the line. Believe me, I'm certainly glad I went to that fire school with my neighbors last week. It's a mighty good training session and prepared us to help one another in case we got a fire. We learned that a few men can handle a lot of fire when they're trained. You know, I believe I'll never forget that fire school. We learned that it took a combination of air, heat, and fuel to make a fire burn. This is the combustion triangle. Remove any one of these elements and the fire goes out. Remove the fuel side, the triangle is broken and the fire goes out. Remove the heat side, it is broken, the fire goes out. Remove the air side and the fire goes out. The fire behavior basics are fire behavior triangle. It's fuels, weather, and topography. So when you as a firefighter are going out there, whether you're going out to on an initial attack fire or you're going out to a large scale incident or you're going out to do a burn, you need to be paying attention to, okay, well, what's the weather? What's it been? How, how is it going to affect my operations today and potentially tomorrow? And what are the fuels set up to be? Are you, are you doing a prescribed burn maybe against some of the snowpack? Are you doing a burn when your fuel moistures are low but expecting your weather to help compensate some of that? Everybody should be going back reviewing the fundamentals. The higher up you go in the food chain, most people, it's very easy to lose the basics. And I think a lot of times when we're in those higher echelon positions, it's like you forget what it's like to be on the ground. And so I think that to bring people back and say, no, this is how it's happening on the ground. We need to review this information. So it's the beginning of the fire season, and there is a lot of information out there that we can collect that can give us the baseline information to tie it to the fire behavior tri triangle. And there is the old saying that only fools predict a fire season, but I think there's some elements there that can really help preface the upcoming season, whether it's what the fuels are sitting at based on what was the snowpack, how much moisture received in the spring, um, maybe how your fuels were burning when you were doing your spring burning program, um, how's the weather setting up, is there a certain geographical area that's starting to see um, fire season starting earlier. So I've created a baseline of information pre-season and now I'm out on the fire line and I'm walking the line and I'm seeing that the fuels are stressed, the leaves are starting to curl, the colors are starting to change, it looks like it's fall but it's July. Those are some of the things I'm putting in my mind or if I do a moisture probe and I look at some of the larger fuels and they're single digits already or I'm kicking the dirt and kicking away rotted logs and there's no moisture left in them. You're looking at your current fire behavior and you make an assessment. Are your lookouts in the right place? Do they need to be moved? What's your communication based on your current fire behavior and what you're seeing and what you're expected based on what you've, you've picked up from, from your data gathering or your assessment period? Are your escape routes and safety zones, are they adequate? So what does all this information mean now that we've gathered out on the line? What it means is you have validated your LCES and now you are ready for your tactical operations for the day. Don's crew was wasting a lot of energy trying to knock the fire out of a big bush. He had them use an indirect attack. They backed up and made the line where the fuel was light. They threw extra fuel out of the way. Then they burned out the fuel between their line and the fire. This burning out is another way to remove the fuel leg of the triangle. We all need to be responsible for our own actions out on the fire line. We can't be dependent on somebody else to always take care of us. And so that comes to the basics that we need to be paying attention to as far as the fire behavior triangle and how is that going to impact us. We need to have a really good understanding of what's the fuels, weather, and topography. And until we have those elements, we're not going to be able to implement our, or successfully implement tactical operations until we have our situational awareness of the 
fire behavior and what's going to happen with the fire behavior. You've got to constantly be keeping yourself um, abreast of the situation. That's the art. You've got the hard science side of fire behavior that, yeah, you can have all these models spew out numbers and it's black and white, but until you're actually on the ground walking it, looking at it, um, assessing and reevaluating, does those, num those numbers mean anything? That's the art. So you have the hard science and you have the art side of fire behavior. Feedback is really important in order to, to have adequate fire behavior predictions. Whether you're on a initial attack fire and you're providing feedback to your local FMO or you're providing feedback to a fire behavior analyst or an incident meteorologist. And the feedback is when you're out on the line and you're working in division alpha for a week, you are the fire behavior specialist for that particular piece of line. You know what's been happening, you know the local wind events, you know the little anomalies that have been happening every day. I can guarantee your weather observations or your weather forecasts will be a lot better if you can provide that incident meteorologist some information from the ground to help them get up to speed. Same with the fire behavior analyst. If you provide them feedback, it will only make their forecast that much better. So one of the things that I want to make sure that we include is making sure that people take the time out to take the weather throughout the event, um, whether it's on the hour or every half hour. Um, it really gives people that time to raise their head gather their situational awareness, take a breather, look around, what's changing, is there something that needs to be readjusted based on the information they're gathering when they take the weather. So many times we get so focused on getting from point A to point B, just putting in line and putting our heads down and dig. All units, stand by the afternoon fire weather forecast for Thursday, July 19th. We have a fire weather watch this evening for dry thunderstorms and gusty winds. Southwest Idaho, Southeast Oregon Zone 408 637. This includes noisy BLM and male BLM. Great. In the general discussion, a stationary upper-level low-pressure system over the Pacific Northwest will continue to cause cooler than normal temperatures and diurnal convection around the region through Saturday. But the best chance for thunderstorms will lie across Southeast Oregon to the West Central Mountains. A gradual warming drying trend will begin on Sunday. The temperature is returning to the seasonal level as the Pacific Northwest and low pressure weakens and shifts northward. Great. The place for tonight has a cloudy chance of seeing thunderstorms. Temperatures up slightly. Lows 40 to 50 in the valleys and 45 to 55 on the ridges. Humidity up slightly. Moderate good recovery. Uh, max 60 to 90 percent. Yes, sir. my rhino. Good job, Langer. Thanks. I just trust that if you want Brian to take care of uh, less of that detail. Let's go, guys. Go get it. Go to Brian. I see this is about We have uh, a full deal on the engine heading your way at the engine 7-1. And we have uh, Type 2 crew head your way. That would be Crew 3 ETE, 30 minutes. Hey! Do that rain coming now? That cloud's coming over us. Watch for a wind change, okay? Got it. 24, cancel. The future of wildfire management is hard to predict, but it's safe to say that change will come. As fire intensity grows and humans continue to encroach upon fire environments, we must adapt as firefighters. We are continually developing new policies and strategies. Technology will unleash capabilities we can only now dream of. Despite this, some of the most fundamental elements will remain unchanged. 
The nature of fire will remain constant and firefighters will still make mistakes. So what will drive change? One can only speculate. Historically, most of the changes in our 100 year history have come from tragedy fires. In order to predict where we are going, you need to understand where we have been. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the great fires of 1910, which devastated large areas of Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington, and left 78 firefighters dead. It's astonishing to see the impact those fires still have on our policies and tactics of today. The 2009 fire season might be considered a bit slow by many and according to the numbers it was. National preparedness levels never exceeded three, with the exception of Alaska. Compared to the five and ten year averages, the amount of wildfires in the 2009 fire season was very similar, but fewer acres burned than the averages of the last ten years. If you were a firefighter deployed to the station fire in California, you would say it was anything but a slow year. The largest fire in the history of the Angeles National Forest cost two firefighters their lives. It burned over 160,000 acres across 230 square miles. Over 200 structures were destroyed with well over 5,000 firefighters battling it at its peak. Over $93 million was spent fighting the arson cost station fire. You might think that the below average fire season would mean firefighters weren't being hurt and killed. If you do, you are wrong. In 2009, there were 15 fatalities. You may be surprised to hear that a high number of injuries were sustained during physical training, and the injury rate remains high from all-terrain vehicles. As you may expect, the number of vehicle accidents is still a concern. Just because it wasn't a mega season doesn't mean that it isn't a dangerous occupation. The new edition of the Incident Response Pocket Guide is on the street. Usually just called the IRPG, this publication is the primary wildland fire job aid and training reference for fire service personnel up to the Incident Command Type 3 and Division Supervisor level. It also has a secondary application for individuals involved with all hazard response. This handy reference has been used by personnel across a wide spectrum of fire service agencies agencies for over 10 years now. More than 70,000 of these guides are issued every year and it has been translated into Spanish, French and Arabic. This 2010 edition of the Incident Response Pocket Guide reflects feedback from the first national comprehensive review of this publication since it was initially put into service in 1999. To denote this, the cover color has been changed to orange. There are a number of significant changes from the previous 2006 edition. A summary of the changes is provided on the last page of the new 2010 edition. Take five minutes before the refresher program begins to check out the new IRPG and become familiar with some of the new features. As your facilitator leads you through this program, start preparing yourself for this fire season by participating in the exercises and sharing your experiences with your fellow fire firefighters. The intent of this portion of the module for helicopter operations safety is to improve our safety with working with helicopters. And the way we're going to do that, um, by the way we're going to improve safety is by limiting exposure. And how we limit exposure is by improving the efficiency of working with helicopters. And how do you improve efficiency is through better communications, both through verbal and visual, and giving good honest feedback um, with the pilot. The whole communications process is for them to communicate to me what they want. Because I don't want to haul, buck, haul a bucket of water maybe five miles and not put it where they want it. Working with helicopters, you're exposed to many hazards as a firefighter. Some you can control and some you can't. And the ones that you can control can be mitigated or dramatically reduced by practicing good situational awareness and proactive communications. The firefighter when working with helicopters is asking the helicopter to perform in a place of its performance where 
It's, it's slow speed and low altitude, which doesn't allow it um, the ability to recover in the event of a loss of power. So the least amount of time you want to ask the pilot to be in that, what we call the dead man's curve, the less exposure that pilot has. And then the less time you're underneath it, at any point in time, if something happens, um, it can come down directly upon you. So you want to just go ahead and make that mission as um, brief and efficient as possible. Whether you're calling in the drop or whether you're just a, a firefighter standing by, it's real important to consider your location in relation to what's above you. If the helicopter is coming in for a drop, you need to realize, you know, the rotor wash itself or the drop from the bucket or the water can dis dislodge debris and throw it upon you. Medium and heavy hollow tankers can drop, you know, anywhere from 300 to 2,000 gallons at once, and that's a great deal of weight. You know, a gallon of water is 8.3 pounds times 2,000. You do the math, that's a lot of weight coming down at once. So you really need to be taking consideration where you're at and consider your escape route to move out of the area clearly. Before you launch, you, you definitely need to take into consideration is this the right, the right tool for the objective that you're hoping to achieve on the fire? What is your tactical objective? Communicating your tactical objectives when you place an order is really important if you're on a large fire to communicate that to the air attack or if it's an initial attack situation to communicate that to the, to the manager of the crew coming in, how are you going to use that helicopter and then also have a backup plan. If, if it comes in and gets a chip light or another priority comes up that you have some other way of meeting your tactical objective not relying on the, on the aviation resource. Uh, firefighters out there do try and, and, and explain their, you know, tactical objective to the pilots and some, some firefighters just make an assumption that the pilot's been here, he's done that, he knows what, he, you know, what they want done and, and they're making the assumption the manager is going to do that with the pilot. But really the ownership is placed on the IC to explain exactly what it is that you're trying to do on the fire. If it's a smaller fire, sometimes you can anticipate, you know, we may only need you for a few buckets and then we'll release you. It's just another tool. It's like a, you know, a Pulaski or a shovel or a chainsaw that you're using on the fire. It's a way to put the fire out. And when you're done with it, you need to just put it down. As the pilot's coming in, if he doesn't know your location, you definitely want to um, consider the aircraft as a clock, you know, with the nose being 12 and the tail of it being 6, and out the right door to the side will be uh, 3, and then out the left will be 9. And as you're coming in, you, you explain your position in relation to them. You know, I'm at your 12 o'clock low or I'm at your, you know, 1 o'clock high, whatever it is, it's coming in low or high. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, at this time, I'm going to use you for a spot drop. Um, I'm at your uh, 1 o'clock right now, 12 o'clock low. I got the panel set up. I have your panel. Yeah, if I can get a spot drop on this panel, that'd be great. Copy. Spot on the panel. And you're all clear. Once they have you in position, um, then you can explain, you know, your position in relation to the parts of the fire, whether it be the heel or the left flank or right flank or the head of the fire. And um, I would ask people to refrain from using the cardinal directions such as north, south, east, or west. Cardinal directions are really tough because especially if I'm hanging out the window and I'm turning around, I'm looking for you. I'm not paying very much attention to which direction is south, which direction is west. Think about what it is you're going to say before you push the button on a radio. And that goes with any fire communications. Don't just key the radio and start thinking. Think about what you're going to say first. Think about phrasing it in the shortest possible means and then key the radio and say what it is you're going to say. And when you're done, you know, let other people talk. Consider what it is that the pilot is doing inside the aircraft when he's bringing a, a long line. Um, load to you or, or a bucket drop to you because um, he's manipulating the aircraft in its highest performance curve. He's, he's operating it at low altitude and at slow forward airspeed and he's having to avoid all the hazards and he's very busy looking out the window trying to keep uh, you safe and trying to keep the load safe. So if you call him and he doesn't answer, he's busy. So just realize he'll be getting back to you um, and not be uh, impatient when you're talking to him. Feedback is real important to the pilot. Good shot, 6-5, go ahead and uh, come on.
one back. And you need to um, to communicate. You know, was the drop accurate? Was it too early? Was it late? And, and getting that, giving that honest feedback directly to the pilot, and they can also communicate to you your directions. You know, maybe your directions weren't very efficient, or, or you know, lack some clarity. And you know, clearing up that communication will make the second or third drop more efficient and reduce the exposure time. When you've ordered an aircraft to support you on a fire, you want to designate competent firefighter that understands how to communicate clearly and concisely and briefly to the pilot and you want to make sure that um, if you're expecting aircraft that you're monitoring that frequency and you're not scanning other channels that can override the priority of the traffic coming through so that, that there's very little hang time in the air for the pilot to try and get hold of people. The consequences of a pilot not being able to contact a ground contact is it forces the pilot to burn circles in the air in, in trying to make contact with the ground person. Um, and if they, if they just can't, they're not going to start doing um, any work on that fire until they can. It's a waste of time, it's inefficient, and flight time is expensive. Um, and it's just putting everybody at a greater risk. The worst situation is when I get all the way over there, still haven't got a hold of anybody, and I'm just flying around with a bucket load of water. And they're not hermetically sealed. I mean, there's water leaking out, and you're flying around burning up flight time. It is important to, to understand that the resource that you're working with, the helicopter and crew that's coming in, may not be from your area. And don't make any assumptions that they know the local landmarks or the local vegetation types or the local fire behavior and how it will be affected by the vegetation that's burning into and try and keep that in mind um, as you're asking specifics of the pilot. It's entirely appropriate to ask the pilot, how is it you want me to call in the drop? Do you want me to show you a panel and put it exactly on the drop where I want it? Um, what is the best way for us to communicate and work this out? The pilot's coming in before they've ever landed or set up for the bucket work. You say, I'm at the heel of the fire. Do you understand where that's at? Do you have the heel of the fire? And they'll say, yeah. And then do you have the head of the fire and the larger fires? It sh it'll be pretty obvious, you know, where the, the area of the most intense heat is. And you say, all right, do you understand the left flank, right flank? This is how we got it going, set up. And, and then once you have that common ground established, that's the best part. The perspective from the air is much different than the perspective of the ground, and don't assume that the pilot knows exactly what you're seeing. Um, topography looks different, fire size looks different, people are hard to see and hard to locate. So really take into consideration in what it is you're explaining for the drop or the mission. As a ground firefighter, when you're working on a slope such as a 30% slope, to you it might appear moderately steep and a lot of times the directions are given as I want the next drop directly upslope of that. Um, from a pilot's perspective, the topography isn't as obvious. From his angle of flight, um, the 30% slope might look totally different to him and it might appear more flat and it's, it's more difficult for him to understand what upslope and downslope is. So it's helpful to be a little bit more specific on how it is you want the drop. Okay, I can't tell where the ridge is up the ridge from here, what direction is that? Take it to the north. To the north, okay. Um, I, I need a visual on the ground. Where's north? Along the tree line. Would that be parallel to that road? That's permanent. It is important to identify yourself if you're calling in the drop to the pilot so they can uh, you know, understand their perspective from what you want, from what they're seeing. And a way to do that is um, if you feel comfortable and you're not concerned with the overhead hazards, you can take off your hard hat and wave it, see if they see you. Or if you have a piece of high visibility orange paneling, you can wave that. They tend to see that pretty clearly. And if not, you can take a bunch of pieces of, of orange or pink flagging, tie it on the end of a tool, and wave your tool back and forth until they establish that they have seen you. Mirror flashes are, are wonderful. Okay, good mirror flash. I have you in sight. 
and just make sure you communicate to the crew only you are going to identify yourself and, and not everybody. If you are choosing to use a trainee, make sure you have a confident person with them, initially establishing communications, and then maybe allow the trainee to, um, to have some opportunities as the drop is being called in a little bit later. The way we're going to improve safety is by limiting exposure. And how we limit exposure is by improving the efficiency of working with helicopters. And how do you improve efficiency is through better communications, both through verbal and visual, and giving good, honest feedback um, with the pilot. Mighty important message for you. It's very rare in history that you have one kind of originating moment. It, in a way, it's a kind of creation story for explaining who we are. In the spring of 1910, the Earth passed through the tail of Halley's Comet. The comet's appearance in the sky seemed to foreshadow the deadly summer of fire that would engulf the northern Rockies. No amount of money, equipment, or firefighters could stop the hurricane of fire that raged out of control on August 20th and 21st, 1910. The big blow-up would be the catalyst of wild and fire suppression for the next 100 years. On August 20th, a terrific hurricane broke over the mountains. They picked up the fires and carried them for miles. The wind was so strong that it almost lifted men out of their saddles, and the canyons seemed to act as chimneys through which the wind and fire swept with the roar of a thousand freight trains. Ranger Ed Pulaski. Before the big blow-up, President Theodore Roosevelt was helping to put conservation on the national agenda. He protected millions of acres in national reserves, monuments, and parks. In 1905, he appointed his friend Gifford Pinchot as chief forester of the newly minted U.S. Forest Service. Many accused the president of pushing his agenda too fast. Senator Habern was always after Roosevelt, as were most of Western senators. They just couldn't stand the Forest Service. But more than anything else, more than anything else, they were against the idea of national forests. The railroads were given more than 35 million acres for free, an area about the size of New England. The Rockefeller family, which is building the biggest and most expensive transcontinental railroad in history, right through the heart of the Bitterroot Mountains, right where the fire takes place. And then you have the Guggenheims and E.H. Harriman and James J. Hill and the Warehousers, families that are largely known to us today probably only for their philanthropies. But then they were at the peak of their gilded age power, and they wanted this land because they were used to getting it for free. Roosevelt took it out of the general public domain and put it in the protectorate of the Forest Service. The forest was to be the people's land. The people were going to use it. Yale School of Forestry had opened, graduated its first class in 1904. 1905, the Forest Service gets control of the National Forest. 
Gifford Pinchot quickly hired the kids from Yale to be the boots on the ground as rangers for the Forest Service out west. All of the young men looked up to Pinchot. He rallied their spirits about conservation, urging them to be part of the great crusade, as he called it. Yeah, he was named Gifford Pinchot, and they were called little Gifford Pinchots, or little GPs. They came out of Yale, and they were just infused with this idealistic image of the great crusade, this idea of conservation. In order to become a forest ranger, one had to have many skills. First, they had to be able to write legible reports in order to keep Congress informed of their findings. Pinchot also required rangers to pass a test of outdoor survival skills. The test lasted two days and was comprised of navigation, horse handling, firefighting, and cooking. Pinchot said, one test was to cook a meal, the other was to eat it. They needed these skills and more to survive because they would be patrolling areas with names like the High Lonesome and the Badlands. Not to mention dealing with the Wild West towns where some people would prefer to kill you over a drink rather than to buy you one. These people could not have been more out of place there, these Yale trained foresters in the Deadwood United States of the West. These young forest rangers would go out west and they would find brothels and saloons Want to buy a lady a drink? One ranger referred to Taft, Montana as the wickedest place in America. The one town of Taft, Montana, named for the 350-pound president, had three prostitutes for every man and a higher murder rate than New York City. Fittingly, a ranger recruiting poster warned, invalids need not apply. The most successful firefighting organization was probably the U.S. Army, and they set a pattern of firefighting that in some ways is still with us. That, that was established in 1886 when the cavalry took over Yellowstone National Park. They were greeted by fires when they rode in. They put out 60 fires that summer. That became a kind of ideal model. The Army had numerous advantages over the Forest Service when it came to fighting fires. The amount of land to patrol for fire in the parks comprises a fraction of the acreage that lies within the forest boundaries. Forest Service Rangers had to plan accordingly. They recognized that you had to control the fires while they were small. So they had to try to find them. They had temporary lookouts. They had telephones, telegraphs. They would try to find fires, send people out. It could take several days to reach a fire. And in a remote area, there might not be any trails. Any obvious route in, you're just bushwhacking through the smoke trying to find this thing. There were no trails or roads, and we had to go in 65 miles. One spent the first week trying to get to the fire. It took more time to get into the country than to put out a small blaze. Ranger Joe Holm. In 1910, Roosevelt was out of office succeeded by President William H. Taft. Opponents of Roosevelt and Pinchot's conservation efforts wielded great influence in Congress. They moved quickly to cut off funding to the fledgling Forest Service. The Speaker of the House, Joe Cannon, said, not one cent for scenery. So there was a huge culture war going on. Pinchot and new Secretary of Interior, Richard Ballinger, disagreed publicly on forest policy. Pinchot, pushing his limits, arranged for a letter to be read in Congress, criticizing the president for misinterpreting Ballinger's policies. This was the final straw for President Taft. He fired Pinchot for insubordination. Well, it should have been a debate about policy. What's the best way to manage fire and protect these lands and communities from fire? Got sidetracked into a battle about politics. Whose view of land management, and the role of government will prevail. So the fire thing wasn't finally about fire. It becomes, it's remade into a polarizing political spectrum. You're either with Ballinger or you're with Pinchot. You're either with limited government and land management or you're with very active government and wholesale commitment to it. You're either with sort of folk knowledge and the Indian way of, of burning the landscape or you're with professional forestry and the kind of academic heft that that brings with it. 
you're forced to choose. And that was, well, that's very effective politics. It forces people to choose, but it doesn't make good policy because there were really a whole array of things. And there were probably different choices that were necessary for different regions. The fires of 1910 were not unique in U.S. history for their size. There had been huge fires before. In 1825, over 3.5 million acres burned in the Northeast, setting into motion a century of very large lethal fires that would follow settlement. During October of 1871, the Peshtigo fire burned across northeastern Wisconsin. Spot fires started 10 miles away after jumping over parts of Lake Michigan. The fire ultimately covered one and a half million acres, burned down 16 towns and killed more than a thousand people. So we have a whole backdrop of these. The 1910 fires really fit into that larger chronicle. What makes them different is that this was not a settlement fire as such, that these were fires that were, that were raging in areas that had been set aside, and, and been set aside in large order to protect them from the axe and fire, as the phrase went. They didn't recognize lightning as a problem, partly because they weren't concerned about fires in many of these remote areas, and in many areas, the fires people set overwhelmed the lightning. In other words, you didn't see it because the amount of human burning. So it was not, in a sense, until they removed people as that ignition source that they began to realize, yeah, lightning accounts for a lot of these fires. And at that point, 1910 does mark a transition. A big fire, but of a different sort, not one set as a result of settlement, land clearing associated with logging and, and agriculture but fires that for a variety of reasons were being set on forest reserves and hence would be fought. Nineteen ten started with plenty of snowfall in the northern Rockies. Lookout Pass held snow well into spring and Placer Creek was flowing strong. But the moisture from the sky abruptly stopped. In April, Glacier National Park reported their first fire and drought began to settle over the area. Storm systems would roll through with the promise of bringing needed rain, but instead they only packed lightning. This was part of a vast complex of fires that swept over uh, the northwestern U.S. Uh, there were large fires throughout the West. Most of it was concentrated in the Northwest, especially in the northern Rockies, extending well into Canada. Let's take a trip from our Canadian friends. When we go out into the woods, let's be extra careful with fire. The nineteen ten fire season would be so severe the Forest Service asked the Army to provide assistance. Most of the standing army in the northwestern U United States was called out to fight the fire, and they were an important presence. The Forest Service would rely heavily on mining and logging crews who had experience fighting fire and working hard as a team. Another makeshift army of temporary laborers had to be employed as emergency firefighters. This was a real cross-section of American frontier life and working class. Large numbers were immigrants. It was a huge period of immigration into the U.S. Many of them were people who just did unskilled labor on railroads and mines or random agricultural work. There were gangs of people that could be dragged out of saloons. They would then be organized much as they would for laying track in a railroad or building a trail to a mine or some other practice. So that's why all those people are living in those brothel-ridden saloon towns is because they've just put this railroad together. Howdy, strangers. Staying long? Communication on the fire lines was difficult at best. In one instance, a whole crew walked off the fire line because they thought the boss was not a union sympathizer. Rumors spread through the press that many of the temporaries were starting fires themselves in order to stay employed. Army soldiers would spread out within a fire crew full of laborers to try and keep some sort of order on the line. There's one reason why agencies like the Forest Service continually look to the Army for help. They wanted some kind of discipline. The Army wasn't necessarily good at digging trenches 
uh, and throwing dirt, but at least they could obey orders. Ed Pulaski had gone west, like many before him, for adventure and, and fame. I had become a miner in the region, northern Idaho primarily. In 1908, he was hired by the Expanded Forest Service as a ranger in Wallace, Idaho. He knew the area, knew most of the people. He was an older guy, he was about 40, much older than many of the real youngsters who, who ran lots of the other crews. There was a question asked on the application, the test for becoming a ranger. And it was, uh, one was, how do you fight a top fire? Which was their term for a crown fire. And the, guy, the guy's answer was, run like hell and pray for rain. By August, the air felt combustible. The townspeople grew desperate. In Wallace, a folk method of creating loud booms to bring rain was employed. Dynamite was randomly exploded for 60 hours straight, but to no avail. Needless to say, people were on edge. On August 19th, Ranger Ed Pulaski rode back to Wallace to get more supplies for his crews and to warn his family. He had been supervising crews up the west fork of Placer Creek, an area of great importance because the fires were close to impinging on the town of Wallace. He told his wife Emma and their 10-year-old daughter Elsie that he had a bad feeling about the next 24 hours. He warned them Wallace will surely burn and they should be prepared to save themselves. And then as he left, on the morning of the 20th, the circumstances were changing and becoming more ominous. When he left to go back to the fire lines, Emma and Elsie rode with him to the trailhead. He told them goodbye and that he may never see them again. Ten thousand people all together scattered all over the landscape. And again, we come back to the absence of any effective communication. When these guys are out in the woods, they're on their own. They had no idea of fronts approaching. They have no fire behavior forecast, no red flag alert, nothing. And suddenly, fire brands start falling out of the sky. Smoke is blotted out the sun. There's enormous towering convective columns. They start hearing this noise. They're in trouble. On August 20th, 1910, the wind began to blow in the northern Rockies and didn't stop for two days. Hundreds of small fires cycloned in a perfect storm that would consume anything in its path. Fire lines that held for days were overrun by 70 mile per hour blasts of wind and flame. Over three million acres would burn in just two days. And this was a thousand year fire. It was off the scale. Nobody had seen anything like this. Nothing with this complex of things in the mountains like that where people were there in harm's way. The moral presence of leadership, the, the imposition of personality uh, and conviction that conveyed that people responded to. They, I mean, they were panicking with some cause. I mean, this stuff's raining out of the sky on them, what are they going to do? They don't know. They need somebody to tell them what to do. And that's what mattered. We reached the mine just in time, for we were hardly in when the fire swept over our trail. One man tried to make a rush outside, which would have meant certain death. I drew my revolver and said, the first man who tries to leave this tunnel, I will shoot. I did not have to use my gun. Ranger at Pulaski. Eventually they all passed out from asphyxiation and some died either from asphyxiation or drowning in the, the muck. But the rest lived as they began making their way out of the entrance, found the body of Ed Pulaski crumpled up on the ground. They thought he was dead. I did not know how long I was in this condition, but it must have been for hours. I remember hearing a man say, Come outside, boys. The boss is dead. I replied, like hell he is. He was temporarily blinded. His lungs were a mess. In the meantime, somebody had gotten out and gone to town. And as far as the town understood, the whole crew had been wiped out. So Pulaski's 
wife. Emma is under the expectation that her husband is among that number. How we got down, I hardly know. We were in terrible condition, all of us hurt or burned. I was blind and my hands were burned from trying to keep the fire out of the mine. Our shoes were burned off our feet and our clothing was in parched rags. We were covered in mud and ashes. Later, as we dragged our way down through Placer Creek, we were met by some women from Wallace. They had hot coffee and whiskey. And although we appreciated the kindness of those brave women, we could take nothing but cold water. Ranger Ed Pulaski. The flames of the Coeur d'Alene raced towards the towns of Wallace, Mullen, Taft, Saltese, Avery, and many more. Well, there were a number of communities at risk, and these are wooden towns. They're made of wooden roofs, wooden sidewalks, wooden buildings. They're, they're extremely vulnerable to fire. Around 9 o'clock on Saturday night, the flames rushed into Wallace from Placer Creek, where Pulaski's crew had been. Spot fire started on the east side of town. Mayor Hansen ordered the alarm to be sounded, and the townspeople became hysterical. Run for your lives! The town is going to burn! The newspaper building became engulfed in flames, and the Sunset Brewery burned while beer poured out everywhere in the streets. On the middle fork of Big Creek, Ranger John Bell's crew of 50 had been working in conjunction with Ed Pulaski's crew. With the fire chasing them, Bell led his crew to the homestead of John Beauchamp. Surrounding the homestead was a two-acre clearing with the creek running through it. Most of the crew laid down in the stream for protection. Seven others, including the homesteader Beauchamp, sought shelter in a small storage cave that had been dug to save his belongings. As the fire reached them, Trees started falling in every direction. One tree came down over three men lying in the creek, instantly killing two of them. The third man had his legs pinned under the tree and screamed for help. There was nothing anybody could do. He perished in the flames along with the seven people who sought shelter in the cave. Ranger Debit was in charge of the Avery District. Sensing imminent danger, he sent the deputy sheriff to Setzer Creek to warn a crew of 70 to evacuate back to Avery. But 28 decided to stay back because they felt the ranger and the deputy were exaggerating about the fires. All 28 men were later found burned to death on a hillside. The largest single loss of a crew, we don't know what happened, but you can see them retreating slowly sort of up the hill. Imagine them sort of doing whatever they could, and then finally coming into a small stand and just being overrun by the fire. The evacuation trains were supposed to be for women and children first, but men shoved ladies off the trains in selfish attempts to save their own skin. A fat man shoved my kids and I off the train and took our spot. The soldiers were doing their best to keep some sort of order. And, and they had to have these soldiers at gunpoint with their fixed bayonets order the men off the train. There was African-American soldiers who had always sort of done the dirty work of the United States Army. They had put down Indian uprisings. They had put down labor wars in this place five years earlier. They show up and they're supposed to save this town and they're greeted by the kind of racism that was typical of the, of the day. They would have stories about how they're strangely quiet. We would think they would be singing at night, so all these sort of racial stereotypes were, but none of the folks who lived there thought these people could fight a fire, but the soldiers saved at least one town, town of Avery, Idaho, and were instrumental in saving another, the town of Wallace. Thank you, soldier. Many of the residents of Taft decided if the town was going to burn, they would drink all the whiskey before it happened. Later, a drunk somehow caught on fire. Screaming and rolling on the ground, a ranger helped to put him out. He took him to a steel box car so he would be protected and rest while the train moved on to Saltese. Once in Saltese, the burned victim laid in the box car dressed in oil and gauze. His drunk friend from Taft decided to check on him. He lit a match to see, but dropped it. The match caught the gauze and the oil on fire. The victim jumped up and ran out of the boxcar, screaming and fanning his own flames. 
This time he was not as fortunate. He was the only fatality of a Taft resident during the blow up. Trains took thousands of refugees into Missoula and Spokane. Fires ranged from 30 to 50 miles wide. Once they got on the trains, they would get to these trestles over the valleys, and the trestles were burning, so they'd go hide in a cave. They'd back the train into one of these caves that would board through the Bitterroot Mountains. And once in the cave, the fire would find them, because it was in search of oxygen. It was a beast. It was a force of its own. Lee Hollingshead was supervisor of a crew of 60 on the west fork of Big Creek. With the fire on their heels, Hollingshead directed his crew to follow the fire line to another burned over area. 19 of the crew members were panic stricken and decided instead to run down the hill to the Henry Dittman cabin, which was surrounded by flames. The men stayed inside the cabin until the roof began burning and falling on them. They decided to make a run for it. The last man out fell down in the doorway and was trapped by debris. This saved his life. Hollings had arrived at the cabin the next day. He was not prepared for the horrific scene he found. All 18 men were burned to death within feet of the cabin, along with the five horses and a black bear. The Firefighters by Arthur Chapman Where's Smith and Hennessy, Edwards, Stowe? Where's Casey, Link, and Small? The ranger listened and murmured low. They're missing, chief, that's all. Where the smoke rolls high, I saw them ride. They waved goodbye to me. Good God, they might as well have tried to put back the rolling sea. I rode for aid till my horse fell dead, then waded the mountain stream. The pools I swam were red, blood red, and covered with choking steam. There was never a comrade to shout, hello, though I flung back many a call. The brave boys knew what it meant to go. They're missing, chief. That's all. Of the 78 officially listed firefighters who died, the deaths occurred in six separate incidents. So it was not even a case of one mass sort of fatality. There were plenty of accounts from the fire that did not involve fatality. Ranger Joe Holmes' crew survived the fire by taking refuge at a sandbar in the St. Joe River, 65 miles into the Bitterroots from Wallace. Everybody reported them dead until the crew walked out one week later. When the fire happens, Pincho realized that, like all people who can see public policy moments, they need their launch point. He could see that this would be the fire that would save the agency. So he immediately went on the attack, he and Roosevelt. Roosevelt was touring the West, reviving his popularity. And they used this fire as the rallying cry that saves conservation. They gave speeches, they gave op they wrote op-eds. The rangers who fought this thing, they're made heroes. The press portrays them as heroic. It was covered all over the U.S. The New York Times had several page one stories. The European press covered it. So suddenly public sentiment shifted and you saw a dramatic effect in Congress where they refunded the agency, they doubled its budget, and they created this bill that had been lingering since Roosevelt's day to create national forests in the east. You would not have national forests in the Adirondacks and Virginia and Pennsylvania and New England without this fire. Pulaski stayed and this is where he lived. He began rebuilding the trails, putting new lookouts up, sending people out to fight new fires, overseeing the, the cleanup, the rehab, the salvage logging, all, all the rest of it. And as part of that larger task, he invented a tool. He thought we needed a combination tool, something to grub with, some kind of adz and some kind of cutting tool, some kind of ax, put them together in his backyard forge. And then over a number of years, refined it, and eventually this was adopted and of course became the Pulaski tool, which is now one of the defining implements of wildland firefighting. If we pick one, one symbol of a wildland firefighter, he or she is going to have a Pulaski uh, in their hand. And in many ways that's a perfect expression of, of how the Pulaski story has become embedded in our culture of wildland fire. Because every time one of us picks up that tool, 
we are reliving that story and all the complexity it brings. You know, William Fox you know, once said that uh, the past isn't dead, it's not even past. There are some senses in which the past in the form of the big blow up isn't past. We still carry Pulaski tools. It's still a defining tool. Much of our paramilitary approach and organization to firefighting still harks back to 1910. The way we fight fires, bringing in people from outside, hiring crews and locals, uh, mobilizing the military. All of these things were first put together in 1910. They are still the way that fundamentally we manage it. The legacy of, of emergency spending, enormously instrumental in shaping, giving us the kind of infrastructure and, and uh, programs we have. So the, the debate, those fundamental debates, those basic questions are still the questions we're asking today. Can we prevent fires? Do we want to prevent fires? What are the cost of doing it? Do we want to substitute for wildfires our own prescribed fires? All those questions were first brought together with great force in 1910. We're still living with them. In our search for answers, please remember our history. The 1910 fires left a plume of scars, lessons, and heroes that were forged nearly a century ago. But out of the ashes, we can still learn from this story and others like it. Much like the Pulaski tool, the firefighter spirit has endured through many different policies, administrations, tragedies, and triumphs. It is now up to us to make sure the bonds and experiences shared by firefighters continue to be remembered and passed on with each swing of the Pulaski from one generation to the next. <laughs>